Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for what I was realizing this afternoon may very well be um, one of our last in-person programs sort of for the, the spring and summer. We find that it's increasingly difficult um, as the days get longer and the weather gets nicer. It's not even snowing today, so that's always, um, always a plus um, to get people to come inside. We um, so I think you know we have a few remaining evening programs, lots of great, um, lots of great field programs coming up. Um, before I turn things over to tonight's presenter, um, I do want to first take a moment to thank Tin Mountains Nature Program series sponsors. Um, they are Hancock Lumber, White Mountain Oil and Propane, and Farm to Table. Um, catering out of West Ospie. So I do wanna recognize them for their financial support that allows us to put on quality programming. I also want to thank those of you watching tonight at home and those of you here with us um, this evening who are current members of Tin Mountain Conservation Center, um, because additionally, your membership dollars also go towards helping us fulfill our mission, um, including being able to put on quality programming such as this. So thank you um, for that support. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, we have some great upcoming programs. Um, starting with this Saturday, um, May 20th is our annual meeting and field day. So um, we do have several field trips going on in the morning because um, it looks like the weather's gonna hold for us at least for, for the first part of the day. So we have our final birding in the Brownfield Bog is this Saturday. Um, that's at 7.30. That's at seven in um, meeting in Brownfield. We have um, Logan Anderson, our resident bird intern. Um, he is going to be leading a bird walk here at the center, as well as sort of a mock point count to showcase a little bit of, uh, you know, of what our research program entails. And so that starts at eight o'clock. I'm leaving here out of the Nature Learning Center. Um, and then we also at 9 a.m. have um, a walk to the quarry on site. Um, and then at 11.30, our annual meeting, um, the, you know, the information, the meeting portion um, starts here, followed by lunch and a keynote presentation by Dr. Rick Vanderpool um, on the role of community science at Tin Mountain and the and the greater um, community. So lots of great, um, lots of great stuff going on on Saturday. Um, and then our, um, on Saturday, June 3rd, um, as part of our North Country Nature Program series, we have a wildflower walk that will be held up at Great Glen Trails. Um, you know, there are some, some pretty spectacular lady slippers up there that aren't to be missed. Um, there's registration information for that program on our website. Um, and later that week on, I believe it's Thursday, June 8th, um, we have our ladies on the lake, um, all women paddle. That's an evening paddle, a Thursday evening paddle on Iona Lake. So we've done that the past couple of years and that's been um, very well received. So um, those programs as well as some others, they're all on our website, tinmountain.org if you want to, um, want to find out more information. But um, I know many of you are here because you are you know, looking for information on um, you know, on financial incentives and, uh, you know, and renew and energy efficiency. Um, and we are very excited to, you know, to have um, tonight's presenter, um, Gabe Chilius here with us from Clean Energy, New Hampshire. Um, he is the, I believe, the North Country Regional Community Energy Coordinator for, is that, yeah. is that, that good? So serving, uh, you know, serving the northern part of the state, um, and he is here to share with us some of the financial incentives that are available um, at sort of the the personal level, the business level, um, as well as where some resources are for um, you know even for municipalities as well. So, please uh, join me in welcoming Gabe. 
Thank you, Nora, and uh, thank you, Russ, for having me here tonight. I'm gonna pull this up for the folks on Zoom. All right. Can you is is it? Okay. Yeah, sure. I, I can just go ahead. Um, so uh, as Nora mentioned, uh, I'm here tonight to kind of speak on some of the incentives that are available across the state for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects um, on the municipal, business, and uh, personal level. I just wanted to give a quick overview of what we are going to be talking about tonight. Uh, just going to talk a little bit about clean energy in New Hampshire. Uh, some examples of some projects we've done, uh, a list of uh, some of the best incentives out there, and a little bit about how to take action. Um, so at Clean Energy New Hampshire, our mission is to promote clean energy and technologies through, uh, through education and adv advocacy around the state for a stronger economic future for all of us. Um, we have people who operate strictly in education, uh, other of our employees work at the state level doing, uh, we have the Energy Circuit Rider Program, which I am a part of. Uh, we've got two of us uh, in Coas County, um, myself, uh, who works with uh, businesses, and Melissa, who works for munis municipalities. And then we've got two other circuit riders, one in the Monadnock region and one on the seacoast as well. And just to speak a little bit on uh, what we do is uh, we provide technical assistance uh, for three different areas, uh, identifying projects. We try and find uh, places where projects are most feasible or in places where uh, folks could really benefit from some of these projects, whether that's saving a lot of money through doing efficiency upgrades or through the long-term uh, savings of doing a renewable energy system. Uh, we do energy use benchmarking for folks where we gather a lot of the data of their fuel and electricity use so that we can kind of show them, we can give good um, estimates on what how much money they might save. And after a project's done, we can really graph and get a better idea of what the savings look like. Um, and third is funding and implementation. Um, as I, I mentioned, we, we really try and help folks uh, get their hands on as many grants and incentives as possible to make these projects really feasible. And uh, we, we like to stay on and see these projects out uh, and, and make sure they get implemented uh, in a proper and a equitable way for folks. Um, we have also been working really hard on, on making a lot of connections uh, across the state. Um, so again, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's a great connection in Conway. Sure. Is it good now? Yes. All right. Thank you. No problem. Cool. Um, so what kind of projects do we work on? Uh, we do a lot of, on the efficiency side, uh, LED lighting, uh, helping folks with buildings get energy audits, uh, weatherization and insulation, uh, benchmarking, uh, renewable energy systems like solar. Uh, uh, one of my, our coworkers who work on uh, more of the municipal end help form uh, energy committees. Uh, we work on uh, EV charging infrastructure and EV education through one of our other programs called Drive Electric New Hampshire. Um, and you can always find out more about us on our website. So just talking about, uh, I picked two uh, of our projects that we worked on in, in COAS. Uh, one was in Shelburne, uh, where 
we first started off doing uh, LED lighting assessment uh, and some upgrades at the Shelburne Town Hall and Transfer Station. Um, and after we helped them make their building a bit more efficient, uh, they were able to apply for uh, an, a block grant from the state and have a solar installed on their town hall. And then Stratford, New Hampshire as well, um, they worked with the select board to fund a solar capital reserve fund um, where the town worked to raise money um, for this the solar array um, uh, on the town hall. And then we also helped them work with the uh, energy audits at their town hall, fire station and library as well as some efficiency upgrades as well, and the eventual installation of another array at the town hall and transfer station. All right, um, so I, I first, I, I wanted to start off talking a little bit about um, energy efficiency um, and kind of, it's an important thing to touch on first before we get into renewable energy uh, as it's a really important part of the energy transition. Um, I, I always like to say that solar is very flashy, but uh, something that is rarely discussed is reducing the amount of energy uh, you re you use. And uh, reducing your energy consumption can directly combat uh, greenhouse gas emissions, as well as reduce your energy costs each month. Um, it, it seems very fairly obvious, but the less energy you consume, the less money you're going to spend. And we, we always like to say is the cheapest way to save money on energy is from the energy that you don't use. Um, so I'm just going to speak a little bit about how you can reduce uh, some of your energy use in your buildings and what some of the incentives and rebates are available to you for that. Uh, and just to preface, uh, New Hampshire spends a lot on energy, uh, as I'm sure most of you have noticed in the past year, our electric bills were very high, uh, one of the highest in the nations. Um, and even now, uh, our, our, the average uh, bill uh, per month is around $312. Uh, and if we look at this graph here, we can kind of get an idea of where a lot of the energy use goes to and what, what are some of the high energy users um, in, in the building. And identifying those kind of allows us to tackle uh, some of those things and make them a bit more efficient. Uh, here's a, a short table um, that kind of gives you a reference of what appliances use the most electricity and where there's the biggest room for savings. Um, something like LED lighting, um, you know, if your building is at least over 20 years old and you haven't touched your lighting at all, you probably still have uh, fluorescent lights or halide lights in there. Um, and LEDs are extremely cheap now, um, and they offer a easy and fast installation on a really quick turnaround on some energy savings in your building. Uh, what's your hot water heaters as well? Uh, typically propane and gas ones can, can be, a, or propane and oil hot water heaters can be a bit inefficient, especially if they're, they're quite old. Um, as it's recommended, you could do something like a heat pump hot water heater or a combined heat and power hot water heater as well. And, and some of these other appliances on here are more of saying, the next time you need to go buy a new dryer or a new refrigerator, look for an Energy Star label. Or if you're a commercial kitchen or a community center that has a lot of these appliances, it might be in your interest to to upgrade them to some some better, um, some more uh, energy efficient equipment. Uh, another big point of. Um, energy efficiency is weatherization. Um, and weatherization can look like uh, a lot of different things, but typically uh, we identify it as uh, insulin foam boards and air sealing of your building. Um, the, the more energy you use to heat air in your building, um, if there's a lot of air leakage in your building, you're essentially uh, paying to heat the air to send it outside. And as I'm sure all of our fathers have said, when you've left the door open in your house is that we're not paying to heat the outside or we're not paying to cool the outside. Um, and, and there's a lot of merit to that. A lot of savings can be seen by uh, tightening up your building, your building envelope. Um, and this kind of brings us to one of the main uh, incentives in the state and that's New Hampshire Saves. Um, and, and this is a program that is funded by all the utilities in the state um, under an order by the Public Utilities Commission, uh, and they're the folks that regulate this. Um, but if you ever look at your electricity bill, there's typically a little indicator. It's maybe a couple cents on your bill each month, but everybody pays into this pot of money that helps to fund rebates and incentives for efficiency upgrades. Um, and it's really in both 
your interest as energy consumers and the interest of the utilities to reduce the amount of energy that you're using. Um, the utilities want to reduce demand on the grid and you want to save money every month. So um, it, it is an important program to have in the state. So um, like I mentioned before on some of the um, uh, energy efficient equipment, they offer rebates on their website um, for washers, dryers, refrigeration, programmable thermostats, high efficiency heat pumps or uh, mini splits like you, like you see there on the wall, uh, heat pump, hot water heaters and natural gas heating equipment, but that's only for, for Liberty and Unitil folks. I don't think there's any gas uh, this far north. All, all of these um, equipment rebates require you to fill out a form on, on New Hampshire Saves website. And typically you just need to be pre-approved before you install um, any of this equipment. If you install it before you send in that form and get approved, they won't send you a check for the rebate. Um, and one other thing I just wanna point out here is it, it's kind of difficult for me to tell you what the rebates might look like for all, all this equipment as it constantly changes uh, with different PUC regulations. Um, so I'll, I'll have a link to the New Hampshire Saves website on, on this uh, presentation, and I really encourage you to go take a look at it. Um, and then another uh, pretty big rebate is their uh, weatherization rebate program. Uh, so they're willing, if you're el eligible, to fund 75% uh, up to $6,000 of the weatherization work that would be done in, in this is specifically for residential buildings. But after you have an energy audit performed uh, and you apply for this program, uh, it, it can fund a, a pretty uh, large portion of a weatherization project, um, as well as residential audits can be performed at at least $100 for qualified. Um, uh, it, it depends. So there's a couple different contractors that New Hampshire Saves works with, um, but they'll they'll pick one for you to have an audit uh, and have someone come do an audit for you. Yes, three. There's a, a lack of auditors all across the state right now. Um, we have, we have a couple that we work with at, when we do projects at Clean Energy New Hampshire, but we've got a pretty good relationship um, with them. Uh, maybe a little different than the utilities have with those folks too. So uh, just uh, still on the uh, energy audit topic, um, our, uh, the folks at the New Hampshire Community Development Finance Authority, the CDFA, uh, offer up to 75%, up to $6,000 of an energy audit cost for New Hampshire businesses. Uh, I've worked with CDFA a lot, and they're really good folks. Um, and their, their audit application is quite easy. It takes maybe 10 minutes uh, to apply, and um, it can kind of make or break, uh, again, uh, funding an audit. So I, I attached Scott Mislanski's contact. He's their, their program manager. Um, and I encourage you also to take a look at their website. And, and now to just to shift gears a little bit into um, what I'm, I'm sure a lot of you might be curious about, and that's the solar PV systems. Uh, and here in New Hampshire, uh, solar PV is the most accessible form of renewable energy uh, for any type of individual or small business or anyone who doesn't have the money to build a hydroelectric dam or a, a wind farm. Um, and right now, the, the cost for installation and the cost of the products are at a historic low. Um, and when combined with grants that fund solar, um, it, it's the most cost effective that it's ever been right now, thanks to some of the IRA programs. Mm -hmm. um, solar has a lot of benefits, and not only does it help uh, contribute to solving some of the climate issues, but uh, it provides a level of energy independence in this uh, volatile market. Um, after talking to a lot of folks who have solar systems over this past year, um, they weren't really feeling the hurt that a lot of other people were on their energy bills each month. And um, if, any of your, if any of you are accountants or economists, I'm sure you could realize that they're saving their, um, their payback period was shortened over this past year as they weren't uh, spending that a uh, large amount of money as everyone else was. So New Hampshire has um, net metering is legal uh, in the state and it's uh, allowed on our, our utility grids. Um, and if anyone's not familiar with what net metering is, 
is that any electricity that you don't use behind the meter uh, gets sent out to the grid and you receive a credit on your energy bill every month for that energy you produce. Um, the meter means the house side of the meter? Yes, the house, whatever um, energy is being consumed, we call that behind the meter, yes. Um, so anything that you produce gets sent to the grid and essentially you get paid for it. Uh, the rate uh, differs between each utility, but it is historically lower than um, what the average kilowatt uh, cost is. Yep. Um, Last year it was five cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah. We just talked to the other day, and it was like five cents a kilowatt hour. They haven't set their lights up. So. Yeah, the, uh, I think the PUC is still in talks right now for a uh, setting with the net, the net metering rate will be this year. But they could. They could. Maybe, maybe they should. Yeah. But that's because you're all producing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's why typically when uh, we're working with folks who are doing solar PV systems, we really recommend that when you install your system is that it's connected to your meter and it's connected to whatever you're using before you send it out to the grid because you're going to... Uh, be seeing a, a better savings uh, using that energy right away instead of what the net metering rate is at. Um, and, and again, net metering is allowed uh, up to 100 kW uh, in, the, in the state. Um, and just to kind of connect, uh, what I was saying about efficiency is that you will see a better return on your investment if you invest in energy efficiency before you install solar. Um, you're using less energy in your building and that gives you more space to send energy out to the grid or if you have to undersize your array or if you want to think about building into heat pumps as well. These are all things to, to kind of keep in mind maybe before you install that solar system. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you had a, had a question. When I look at one of these programs, I use the phrase insulate before you insulate. Yep, I, I think that's a, a good mantra. Yeah. Um, so, just a, a little bit on the IRA and the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. Uh, I'm, I'm going to highlight a couple of programs that are out there today, um, but there's a lot coming down from the federal government right now. It's like drinking from a hose. Um, and at Clean Energy New Hampshire, we have some internal databases that, that we use uh, to help us apply for grants. Um, and we're in the process of working on something that would make a, kind of a master list of incentives available to everyone around the state. Um, and I, I, I do have, I'll, I'll go forward, is something I, I've been using and that, uh, again, I'll make this available to everyone, is the Rocky Mountain Institute in Colorado mm -hmm. has a spreadsheet that they uh, update uh, quite often, and that's not just energy incentives, but everything that's coming down from the IRA right now, in, if anyone ever wants to take a look at that. So to get started, um, I'm going to focus on a grant that is specifically for businesses uh, in the state, and that's the USDA Rural Energy for America program, or what we call it's REAP. Uh, so it's for uh, for-profit businesses only, and they must be in a rural uh, eligible zone, um, and that comes from the USDA state uh, of what they classify as being rural. The grant funding, uh, so grant funding is available and loan guarantees uh, for renewable energy systems or a large-scale energy efficiency project. But the one criteria is that the systems must be carbon negative. Um, so unfortunately, that doesn't uh, include any methane uh, capture uh, and production like uh, you might see on dairy farms sometimes. The grant max has been upped now uh, about a month ago to a max of a million dollars, up to 50% of a project cost. Um, and the applications open uh, once every fiscal quarter. Um, and if you don't make it in in quarter one, you'll roll over to quarter two and so on, except for the final quarter of the fiscal year, you'd have to reapply uh, again at the end if you if you don't make it in. Uh, I, I've worked, sure. Yeah, so the, the USDA has, has a big map um, that you can look at, and I think they have a link to it on the, on the REAP website. Um, but they have different zones that they classify, but anything in Northern Grafton, Carroll and Coas County does classify as rural uh, for New Hampshire. I, I don't know, I, typically when I'm over in Coas, we use the notch. Uh, after you get on the other side of the notch, everything up there is pretty much considered rural in USDA's eyes. Um, but I, I don't typically work over here in Carroll, so I, I don't know if 
off the top of my head. Um, I've worked with uh, Reap uh, a couple times now. Um, the application is it's not that hard, but uh, that's something that we do uh, as part of my position is to help folks apply for grants. Um, and this is one of the, the bigger grants that's out there right now and really one of the only ones that's available to small businesses um, in the state right now. So uh, uh, the U.S. State Community Facilities Grant, uh, specifically for public bodies, community-based nonprofits, and tribes, uh, New Hampshire has an eligibility list by town, um, and this is kind of an adder or a, a scale of what percentage of a project cost um, that the USDA will fund. Um, again, the maximum is up to 75% of a project cost. Um, and these funds can be used for a multitude of things, but for the purpose of this presentation, um, they can be used to purchase uh, energy systems, uh, construct new efficient buildings, um, improve uh, central community facilities, um, and kind of purchase equipment uh, that might be needed to do some of these projects. We've worked with the, the block grant, or sorry, the community facilities grant uh, quite a few times. Um, and specifically, I'm, I'm working with uh, two daycare centers in Colbrook and Lancaster right now, um, where these projects are going to help them do some weatherization in their buildings, and it's kind of swooping in, and it's a real saving grace for some of, some of the nonprofit entities um, in the state. Uh, another one, uh, a different gear here, but it's the EPA Clean School Bus Grant, um, and it can range from twenty-five thousand to three hundred seventy-five thousand, uh, depending on if you're doing a compressed natural gas or an electric school bus. Um, and I just kind of wanted to include this in there to kind of talk about some of the action that you can take in your uh, communities, and that's to be vocal to your school board and ask them to apply for these grants. Um, as it can, you know, it saves you a little bit on, on your tax dollars, but it's something that's beneficial to your community as well. Um, there's priority school districts um, it, around the state. Uh, we have helped Berlin uh, apply for the grant, um, but I believe it's a lottery-based program. So it's a lottery based on whoever's applications qualify. Mm -hmm. And I know Berlin did not uh, make it in, in this past round of funding. Uh, moving on to the energy efficiency and conservation block grants. So this comes down from the state, but it uh, starts at the federal government. Um, and certain high priority states are given access uh, to these block grants. Uh, they're available to all 10 county governments, um, and they can fund specifically uh, energy projects, uh, whether solar PV systems, energy efficiency projects, transportation, like setting up electric vehicle infrastructure or having municipal vehicles be used uh, by EVs, uh, as well as methane capture and energy audits. Uh, this is a pretty significant grant. Um, I, I don't have uh, much experience applying for this uh, grant myself, um, but I know that it has been used by some of the schools in the North Country, as well as um, municipalities to offset the costs of transfer stations, town halls, and libraries, uh, which really, it, it helps folks in the community save a lot of money uh, on their taxes each year. Uh, and there's some significant savings that can be seen uh, after these projects come in and these big uh, installations happen. Uh, another program that's exclusive to something like this area is the Northern Borders Regional Planning Commission Catalyst Program. So this is a competitive grant available to local governments, tribes, and nonprofits. Um, and again, specifically in Belknap, Carroll, Cheshire, Coas, Grafton, and Sullivan counties. Um, Northern Borders was put together by all the governors uh, in New England whose states border Canada. And it's a, a pretty large fund that goes to a lot of infrastructure programs in the state, not always energy, but in the past, we've had folks apply to have energy projects done as they're seen as uh, becoming a pretty uh, crucial piece of infrastructure in communities. Um, and, and outside of uh, infrastructure, they also fund non-infrastructure projects, which include job training, employment, education, and technology development. Uh, kind of as we were mentioning, it's becoming increasingly difficult to find electricians and contractors to do a lot of this work in the state. So um, this is another option that communities can use or if uh, anyone works in the educational space, uh, they can apply for this grant to help fund some of those programs as well. 
Um, again, infrastructure programs have a max of a million and education on about $500,000. Is that tied in with the Regional Planning Commission, like the Country Council and, and those groups, or? I, I believe they're separate entities, but North Country Council does work pretty closely with NBRC. Okay, is this Regional Planning Commission? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it like they are a planning commission, but different entities than than some of the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this one is specific to schools. Uh, it's the New Hampshire Department of Energy's School Energy Efficiency Development Grant or SEEDS. Um, these are used by public or charter schools uh, in towns with fewer than 10,000 people. Uh, and they can provide support and technical assistance for schools um, in smaller communities to implement energy efficiency projects and make uh, some necessary upgrades. Um, in Colbrook, my coworker Melissa Elander has worked with them to replace all of their uh, lighting with LED systems, as well as working on their boiler systems. Um, and they're in the talks to do a solar PV system on the school as well. Um, it's about one grant a year, so it can be pretty competitive, but it's uh, up to $150,000 and only requires a 10% match. And lastly, I just want to uh, touch on some of the tax credits that are coming down uh, through the IRA right now. Um, I, I had a gentleman here uh, bring up solar for residential uh, when he first came in. And unfortunately, there really isn't a lot of grants available to private owners right now, but there is a pretty large 30% tax credit that's available to people who install solar PV systems. Um, this credit is also available to folks who do um, energy efficient uh, home improvements, uh, the residential clean energy, um, uh, building new uh, energy efficient homes receive a credit as well. Um, the solar investment tax credit and a electric vehicle purchase tax credit as well. And uh, that's also a 30% if you, if you buy an EV. And here in this next slide, um, sorry, I got cut off a little bit there. This is the adder that the federal government has released for this tax credit. Um, so right now the standard uh, tax credit is about 30% and that's going to run uh, all the way till 2030, uh, which is, is, is quite impressive, um, as well as some adders that are available on that. Um, for example, if you were to build a, sol a solar PV system on a former brownfield site, uh, these are sites the EPA has uh, designated as a contamination zone, such as um, a landfill, you'd get an extra 10% on that. Or if you're in a low income area, or if you're operating um, in a, an affordable housing, comp affordable housing complex as well, you're eligible for up to 50% on that. So um, the, these tax credits are, are pretty significant as well. And I also want to mention that if you were someone who's not tax liable, like a nonprofit, you would receive this tax credit as a check, uh, straight up, um, mailed to you. So it's, um, they just changed that this year. Yeah. So if you are interested in one of the IRA uh, tax credits, is there anything you have to do in advance to either qualify or let them know, or is it strictly after the fact that you apply for it? Yes. Yeah, so when you are uh, filing your taxes at the end of the year uh, on the IRS website, there are certain forms here, uh, like 25C, 25D, that you would fill out and send in with your taxes. Um, it's strictly after the fact. Yes. Yes. Um, after, uh, after purchase. Yep. A similar. Does that, does that roll over? No, it's a, a one time. That's one time, but if you if you if you're not paying enough taxes, uh -huh. will it carry over the second year? Because like an automobile, it won't. You better do it the first year. Yes, uh, it a little connection. Yeah, so I don't know if if you go over if you receive that as a check as a private owner as well, or if it would just come back on your that uh, that uh, what you would make up in that percentage, like you're saying, would just be added added to your tax return. Um, that's how I know it. Uh, the IRS is not very clear uh, about a lot of this. Um, I but, think it's also, no? I think it's a one-time thing. You have to take it first year. Because when we put most of them, we make sure we put them in the tax. I know it's that way with automobiles, but I thought it did go over. I don't think it's something 
go see for you. If you have a friend, I don't know, they're taking on your taxes if you have money coming back or something, you can put it in five minutes or something. Correct. Yes. These tax credits now have, have made power purchase agreements uh, less desirable than they were because the power purchase agreement, uh, as we did in Madison when we did that system, uh, because you, a nonprofit couldn't take the tax credit because it wouldn't pay a tax. Right. So uh, that 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 uh, required a power purchase agreement, which it wouldn't now going forward with these with these credits. Right, and I, I don't know what it looks like on the if. If you're doing a power purchase agreement, what it might look like on the solar installer side, if they're collecting all these uh, tax credits uh, for, for all these PPAs that they're doing. Um, but it definitely has given a bit more power back to folks who might not have enough capital to invest in a system uh, straight up and would rather do a PPA. Um, in, in my opinion, owning your panels is a better investment than doing a power purchase agreement. Uh, and these tax credits kind of give people a, a bit more leverage in, in some of these situations. Uh, Dave, before you move on, there was a question that, that came through, and I know that I'm not in your area. Um, you mentioned that um, there are and for um, yes, sure. Sorry. Uh, so this is uh, Sarah here, and she's asking what the IRA guidelines are for nonprofits to receive the direct pay for solar PV insta installations. Um, so, Sarah, as far as I know, when you as a nonprofit uh, would fill, file your taxes at the end of the year, you would fill out one of these forms and send it into the IRS, and the IRS would be the um, the group that would send you your check back at the end of the year. Um, for the as far as guidelines, as far as I see it, it's as if you were writing anything else off on your taxes, right? Um, you know, whether that's making a charitable donation or, or not, anything that is uh I think you'd probably have to send in a receipt of purchase for that. Um, some of the proof um for for um uh, kind of like any other uh, investment you would make that you would send back um, on your taxes. Sorry, and I'm I'm just taking. Yeah. Okay. That was just when you were talking about funding and what I'm. Yeah, that um, that's a great question. And so I personally was working with um, one of the uh, bus companies in the North Country, and uh, we were trying to get them to apply because private fleets can apply for this program and they can have some of their private buses uh, swapped over to EVs. Uh, so it's available to private fleets uh, and uh, public schools as well. Um, we just didn't have uh, much luck working with uh, that private fleet and applying for the program, but but both are eligible. Great. Um, and I just wanted to uh, kind of talk about, at the end so a little bit about some collective action that, that folks can do. Um, you know, get active in your communities, join your energy committee. If you don't have one, try and start one with, with other folks who are um, energetic in your community to maybe help capitalize on some of these grants. Uh, a lot of the uh, organizations that we see apply for a lot of these municipal grants are active uh, energy committees. Uh, they're the folks who, who get a lot of that work done um, in the towns. Um, I'm also working uh, with one of the energy committees in Bethlehem to do a solarized campaign for business. Dave Businesses, Dave I'm sorry. Dave yep, David and um, Bruce uh, Kaplan as well, um, and we're working with them to get a bunch of businesses on board. Um, and solarized campaigns can be for homeowners and businesses. And what we're trying to do is work to get uh, a group rate from a solar installer, which is kind of bringing the overall cost down for everyone going in together. Um, if any of you folks are familiar with Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire, um, you can work in your community to get active and try and join them. Uh, they work to help. Um, they're a 
in between energy uh, suppliers and customers, and they work to help people uh, get really good rates around the state. Uh, they just launched this year, um, but you can work in your communities and uh, get them on board with that, uh, as well as vote for sustainable energy policy. Um, your ideas matter, and you should tell the people who have the power to apply for these things and make some of these things happen. We started with solar right here in the valley. Yeah. But uh, at, at the time, I guess it was difficult to find installers. Uh, and the installers were, were doing what we were trying to do. So we said, let them go to it. So, yeah. Um, and so we, we, did, we did try that here. But it just didn't take off. Not really. It was four, five years ago. And, no, it didn't. I mean, we just, the installers were, were doing what we, what we were trying to do. So we, we let them go ahead and take have you had success? Well, you probably do with David because he's such a go-getter. Yeah, we're we're still pretty uh, early in it, but we are. We have about seventeen businesses uh, that are signed up for the seventeen oh. in Bethlehem. Yeah, it's a pretty heavy lift, and uh, we're actually um, trying to uh, do a couple of reap applications um, for them each quarter to help also bring down the costs of, of these solar arrays for the businesses as well. Um, a big thing right now is we're doing a lot of the uh, the SAMS numbers, um, the system for award management numbers that come from the federal government, which is uh, kind of a leg lift that if anyone wants to apply for those is going to have to do. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at in that stage right now. But it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. I, and I also just wanted to mention is to call your legislators, um, connect with your legislators to express support for New Hampshire's energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. Um, and feel free to connect with us um, as well. We have a, a LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, and we're uh, very active with events on our website as well. So thank you. And I was uh, hoping I could open it up to answer uh, any questions folks might have. Me again. Uh, I have a question about a local nonprofit that, has, that wants to do a solar thing, but they can't because they are in the floodplain. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so can, can they... <laughs> Can they go off site and still qualify for all this? Um, I mean, it, it depends uh, what grant it might be, but typically, if it's on their property, yes. Um, you kind of have to weigh the cost of getting that array interconnected as well, depending how far off site it is as well. But if they were to send that energy they produce back to the grid, they could get the benefits of those net metering credits from the colleges. It has an array in farming in Maine. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you it, that gets into the weeds a little bit of. Um, possible. It's possible. The savings won't won't be uh, as great as using it behind the meter, but yeah, and you can they can capitalize on the renewable energy credits from that as well. But it, it is it is possible. Yeah. They can't go on the building because the renewable support. Yeah, and. You know that that's uh, of the USDA doesn't like to fund programs that, that might be washed away in, in five years. Yeah. Yes. To pursue LED lighting for a business, sure. Is that CDFA? No. So uh, CDFA helps with the energy audits. Um, and I, I can exp I can go into detail about that a little bit if you like, but uh, LED lighting rebates can be found on the New Hampshire Staves website. And um, typically, uh, there's a list of uh, electronic uh, wholesalers where you can buy LEDs with like a point of sale discount on them. Or if you have an electrician to do a pretty large project, uh, you can ask your electrician to to go to the wholesale uh, one of the qualified wholesale outlets and ask for that. Yeah. Does it have to be the building owner that has the audit done? It could be a tenant. Um, that's a great question. And it does in, in housing buildings, it does have to be the the owner of the building. It, it can't just be a tenant that, that doesn't have part of it. Commercial. commercial, yes, it, it does. Um I, I found that out in Gorham. We have a family resource center there that's owned by the town, and the town has to be the one that applies for that. So so yes, the owner of the building. Is required to do that. Have the yep. Any, I'm just going to check the the Zoom. Chat. 
the Rocky Mountain Sierra. This has been recorded, so that yeah. oh, yes, yeah, so yeah, it does. Ha it has been recorded. Oh. All right. Well, um, thank you all so much for having me tonight. I, I hope this was a bit informative. Um, and there will be a recording of this. Um, and I, I'll have my contact information if anyone has any more questions or wants to get involved. I'm happy to follow up um, any other time as well. So one final thing from the Tim Mountain Educate. Uh, are you at all interfacing with the window dresser, which is a project we've been involved with here? The insulated window inserts mm -hmm. from uh, that are done on, on the, the, the barn raising principle. Uh, we've done two builds here in town. There's another one coming up this year. Uh, have you been involved with that directly? I, I, I have not. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I would not recommend it, you know, uh, sealing up your windows uh, as well. Um, we typically, I, I haven't worked with that a lot because typically energy auditors like to focus on vertical airflow. Um, air is more likely to leak out of your roof in your attic than it is horizontally through your windows. So it, they usually tackle those spaces first. Uh, before moving to windows um so i i don't have a lot of knowledge on that but i i wouldn't say that it's, it's a bad thing yeah. at all yeah yeah and we'll make sure you... my understanding from some of the conversations i've seen uh at the board level with the kids are is that they they don't qualify for any of the ira funds yeah I had it. No, no, no.